Hello and welcome to the Kevin Boy Knits Woolcast, coming to you deep from the Canadian forest. This is Christopher. And this is the other guy. Jamie. This is our next installment in our Canadian interview series. I can't wait. We are going to Topsy Farms on Amherst Island. And in the meantime, I want to tell you a little bit of history about Amherst Island. Okay, well, while you tell the history, I'm going to go pack the car. We got a little history about Amherst Island. It's one of the larger islands in Lake Ontario. It's part of an archipelago that includes Nut Island, Grapey Island, Salmon Island, and the Brother Islands. Now, this island is roughly 12 miles long by about four miles across. It was long inhabited by the indigenous peoples of Canada for centuries. They called it Caenestegnego. I'm not sure of the pronunciation, which means Big Long Island. Later, in the 1600s, European explorers, including French explorer de la Salle, visited the area. It was named by the French Tonti Island after Henri de Tonti, which was his lieutenant. Now, by 1792, the United Empire Loyalists, loyalists to the British, loyal to the British throne, made their way to the area and settled on Amherst Island. Now, the prime economy now in the mid-1800s was primarily farming for wheat and barley, and also there was a lot of sailing and a lot of transport on the waterfront, and there was also a shipbuilding yard. Following that, in the, uh, following that, the shipbuilding yard moved to Prince Edward County, the lands were depleted with all of these years of harvesting and farming, so the economy sort of went so-so. And then a lot of Irish immigrants made their way to the area. And this would have been taking you into the later of the 1800s. There, was dairy, there were dairy farms and crop farming. And um, there were several churches and quite a few inhabitants. Today, there are roughly 450 inhabitants on the island. But that doubles in the summertime with a little bit of the tourism and visitors to the island. The island includes a general store, there's a restaurant, there's a church. Uh, it's very quaint, it's very pretty. And uh, that's about the history that I'm going to tell you today. Jamie, let's go, we're going to miss the ferry. Ferry? <laughs> what do you call a ferry? I think that's my cue to go. So sit back, grab your favorite drink, and let Topsy Farms tell you their story. We are at beautiful Topsy Farm on Amherst Island, and who are we with? My name is Jacob Murray. I'm one of the owners here at Topsy Farms. It is gorgeous. What a beautiful, beautiful place. Boy, this November is all right. I know, it's fantastic. So did you grow up here, or what's the, tell us the whole story. I grew up in one of the bedrooms behind us. Oh, wow. Yeah, so this is uh, 40 years on the farm, minus a couple for school at Waterloo, and a yep. couple of years in Kingston. But otherwise, this is the only place I've ever really wanted to live. Unless yeah. I'm surrounded by water, I don't feel comfortable. And it's gorgeous. You're absolutely gorgeous. So how did this all begin? How did Topsy Farms start? Topsy Farms started in 1972 by a boatload of draft-dodging, peace-loving hippies. They uh, smelled society going off and yeah. just they wanted to build a world that they felt comfortable in. Awesome. So it was uh, there was some waterfront for sale and they they got it for a pretty good price shared their resources and the cooking and the, the farming chores they originally wanted to build a geodesic dome 
and the the local mayor convinced them to not tear down the big beautiful barn. Yep, smart. Because it's a you know a gorgeous structure, and then well, he happened to have some cows for sale. So as as my dad says, the uh, the folly of farming started that day. Oh wow! So what was it going to be before that? So the, so it was they bought this land. There was a they were basically were they going to was farming even in the cards then? Or I think they just... were more like like market gardening type, but just okay, for themselves. Sure. You know, yeah. they they wanted to just grow their own food. Um, uh, live their life, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, yep. and and build a world that they they wow. wanted to see. And what would this geodesic? I've never used that word before. That <laughs> <laughs> dome. What, what, what that have been exactly? Well, I've seen them before. The so uh, like a bunch of small triangles, I believe, and then filled with glass or or some translucent material yeah. and you would all all live in there and, and share the communal space. So it would be like a bubble house. Basically a bubble, bubble house. house. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so okay. they they did not build the <laughs> they did not build the bubble house instead they got animals and, and and we've been we've been farming here ever since but those you know those early philosophies have always stayed true the the harmony with the land the animals and each other has always been such an important part of this place and has that has never changed. Yeah. So were sheep here first, or were it cows, or how did that work? A couple of cows, a couple of chickens, a couple of goats, all yep. those things. Uh, the sheep came a little bit later with uh, our British shepherd Christopher, who graduated nice at name. one of the uh, one of the prestigious uh, English universities, and from then on, we've uh, we've been in the sheep business. Oh, great! And so, how did that start? How did that? Was it just a couple of sheep, and where did they come from? A couple of sheep where they actually came from somewhere here in Ontario. But the idea of raising sheep outdoors in Ontario was a very unusual thing. Yeah, so we've been oh, sure. we've been pioneers doing that from like from the early days. Because most people who keep sheep in Canada would keep them in the farms. Yeah. We're like, well our barns are great but they're not good for keeping animals in and maybe they'd be healthier outside. Do you know what the original sheep were? I believe uh, Suffolk, so the the black face, okay. uh, large body, with the white wool. And so, how many sheep do you have? Or, have, or I guess take us through that line. How did how did the sheep numbers grow? And so the arc has been small to medium to large to medium, okay. and we're we're in the process of finding our balance over the last forty plus years. This is our our fiftieth year right now. We're we're starting to celebrate our our fifty year anniversary. And awesome. and it's taken that long to make all the screw ups, so we cheers uh, yeah to that yeah, that's awesome. Awesome. yeah. That's we've uh, we've done all the screw ups so so now we can start it's all fresh. Part of it's all part of learning. That's right. right. We have uh, a, a new generation. The uh, the the older original members have have retired off. Uh, they're still puttering around. My mom's in the garden. My dad's driving through the shot with his his machine, not realizing. And, uh, <laughs> so you know they they keep busy as as best they can and. Yep. and it's uh, very much a family and friends venture. Oh, awesome. So you have to think back then in the early days because you're saying, you know, peace and harmony. So, I mean, your, your parents then, 50 years, they've lived their lives in this peaceful, harmony, beautiful environment for 50 years. 50 years. It's changing now with the new generation. Yes. Slightly. There's still the peace and harmony, but, you know, it turns into more of a there's got to be a bit of a more of a business side to it now because living in peace and harmony and for yourselves and i think now it's still so encouraged for now the next generation of course so how do you think what's the biggest change you're seeing now with yourself and other members who own the farm um running it as a business but still keeping that balance of peace and harmony and just you love what you do you have to. yeah so I think the, the easiest way to answer that question is to think about small, medium and large farms. Topsy would be considered a medium farm. And like a medium farm is basically destined not to survive. You are too big to be a hobby farm. So yes, it, it requires absolutely. an sure. extraordinary amount of like ongoing effort, but you're okay. too small to be an industrial factory farm. You're, you're in right. this weird middle zone where you're basically screwed over the long run because you can there are so many systems and i'm and like machinery animals buildings uh human resources 
everything right from the start to the finish things only want to break down sure that's all they want to do yeah. like it's uh the entropy of a, running a farm is obvious everywhere you turn and it, it requires a constant input of effort so as the price of everything rises because of like, inflation and everything we have to adapt the farm into a business to your to your question to your point and that like we got our first wool blanket made in the 90s because we realized that the raw wool would not even cover the cost of the shearing so yeah. we we hire professionals to come in because we have when you have 500 of a thing you don't want to do it yourself shearing is the single most caloric intensive activity that humans can do it is, they one shearer will burn the equivalent of two and a half marathons worth of caloric output per day per wow. day okay D okay jamie we should get into that then for sure yeah. we're in off our covid 19 pass <laughs> yeah. Speak for yourself. you put on your covid 19 <laughs> okay. so so in that like we we took this raw material that was basically worthless and started making them into blankets i'm like okay now you have a blanket how are we going to sell it so yeah. there's a, yeah. this yes. internet thing, which we got one of the very first online stores. I remember hearing the word e-commerce and had to learn what that was. Yeah. You know, you get the dial-up modem with the... Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, and uh, and then we, we turned one of the outbuildings into a retail store. So location, location, location. Absolutely. We're at the ass end of a gravel road on an <laughs> island on the way to nowhere. <laughs> but people started to come. Okay, speaking of that, so just for the viewers, talk a little bit about what does a farm look like? How many acres? Tell us a little bit about that. Okay, so we are on the very western end of Amherst Island, which mm -hmm. is near Kingston, between Kingston and Prince Edward County. Uh, we, we control slash own slash rent about 450 acres oh at this gosh. western end. Wow. And then we rent another 400 or so acres um to the east of here so wow. the sheep will graze or we will take hay basically from here all the way down to where the ferry docks yeah. in stella so our, our sheep rotation will be around the farm in the early part of the spring and summer and then they graze to the east eat all the the forage and then we will graze them back again so that's that's the local traffic jam is when you're you're oh, moving yeah, sure. <laughs> moving sheep down the road so you call all the neighbors and they come out and protect their garden <laughs> and they, they put their dogs away that is amazing some of them will join in so we'll end up with this parade going down the road and is that what we see on youtube is that what is that some yeah, of the, yeah. yeah yeah the things yeah. you just don't think about it. <laughs> like who would ever even think of what it is you need to do just for that move alone just for that move alone and yeah then, it's incredible and then every field has to have its its fence reworked every year because you're putting fence posts in the ground and nature doesn't want that yeah the frost will heave them out so that's a sledgehammer and uh you know we're talking dozens and maybe more kilometers worth of electric fencing which the deer will run through and and they'll knock it down so then you have to staple those all back oh, up and tighten the lines and then if if one wire touches another wire it shorts out but now you have to look at 12 kilometers worth of wire oh, to find oh the gosh. one spot where it's touching wow. i mean it's it's almost like christmas lights only you have <laughs> yeah well, it is living. very much <laughs> like christmas one, lights and you only have you know <laughs> 10, 10 feet and you're losing your mind yeah and you're doing, a, imagine that as 12 kilometers, 12 kilometers. <laughs> so remember that at christmas time when you're trying to find that one light it's like damn it <laughs> on a five foot or ten foot you know light circuit okay so, put that into perspective and uh yeah so so as like as my my parents and the older the older people are, are aging out new new people have to come on sure and what we've learned is that one just like the core of us who have sort of grown up here we cannot do all this work we can't do it so we have to to train new people and what we have learned is that simply the language that we use to describe the fields is the starting point like you have to teach oh, sure. and train so much it's not about how to make an electric fence that's easy but it is everything that goes into that yeah. where the stuff lives on the farm what to do if right. you run into problems and even the field knowledge of where the stones are to not run the vehicles onto or the oh, or the pitfalls yeah. of the rut that you left three years ago that you just haven't gotten around to if you think fixing. about navigating navigating you know 
water system like out there, you need to know it's those who know the route that don't hit the shoals and that's not, but you never would think of that on the terrain. On the, yeah. And then every day you're all over the fields with equipment or what have you. So your analogy game is on point. Is that what it's called? <laughs> <laughs> Anal- I did an analogy. <laughs> Cheers to that. Yeah, cheers to that. But it really does put it into perspective. Yeah. No. <laughs> yes, I but you're, okay. taller, you're, you're taller. You're taller in the chair. That's so right. That's okay. right. <laughs> and you know, and everyone knows I like to learn things. So you know, I, I'm just fascinated. But I hope everyone. I, I'm fascinated by every tidbit because it's it's incredible. Like people think of a farm, they think okay, you know, they just know. I think the average person knows farm life would be. Difficult. They're like, okay, yeah, it's, you work on a farm. It's yeah, it's hard. Holy, this is explaining details, and you're not even you're just scraping the surface. Scraping the surface. Like how much work it entails oh to gosh. just keep it going, and and the numbers of people and the the yeah the yeah. energy and the focus and the yeah the uh, energy. I think that's it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. 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 So tell us how we've got a lot of viewers who like wool. So how does wool play into to the farm and? Um, what's that? What has that been like over the last ten years? Well, it's it it is a very funny thing because wool that started off as like the thing with the least value is ultimately how we are going to preserve and keep the farm. Like our mission statement is very very simple. It is keep the farmland as a farm. Yeah. And to sell sheep for meat is a losing venture from a multitude of factors. Topsy started that way and we are getting away from that Mm. i would like to have a flock that is just for wool production that is the goal and that is what we're getting towards because wool is the most renewable fiber on earth and the sheep when they are raised on pasture improve the land everything is better when you have sheep grazing and then put the compost back into the soil in the winter yep and we've done we've done a lot of um you know, we, we like the diversity of wolves and sheep and heritage sheep and Christopher especially. And I'll talk a little bit about, you know, the history of different sheep. And right now or in general? In general. Okay. And right now, <laughs> no, but right now. Yeah. I don't know if I can talk about my tea or not. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to put my legs up. <laughs> I know, he usually might go into something like, okay, let me tell you a little bit about this first sheep. Thing. No, I'm not going to do that. But no, what, what I'm thinking is because uh, as you may know, as you know, I mean, having the sheep graze, you know, naturally and out there in the open um, and the location of where you're at. And because they're on the water, is there a bit of a microclimate here or is it just or is it considered that because yeah. of the because if you have the, the ideal setting and food and, and, and the natural way that you let the sheep roam and feed, that comes through in the wool, as you realize that, the quality of the wool as well. Very much so. And then the different types of sheep. So you could be looking at, have you thought about different types of sheep that you would specifically want to sort of switch it up or, yes. or move towards a, a breed or two in particular? Yes. So the, like, the answer is a general yes. What we haven't gotten into is the specifics. Because they are raised outside, um, we are, we're nervous about just jumping in and sure. going, oh, well, Merino is a wonderful wool. Let's get a bunch of those because we don't know, a, like a sheep has to be raised for us to, to buy the, the sheep. It has to come from a place that is similar. For sure. Yes. Yeah. Otherwise they yeah. won't last very long because, yeah. you know, we require a certain hardiness because yeah, there is a nice microclimate. Like right now, the lake is keeping everything temperate. But come winter time, when all the leaves on the yes. trees die down, that west wind is just there yeah. is there is nothing to stop it. No, that's important because you can't just pick a specific breed, bring it here because you've got a different climate, you've got different different conditions, and it's going to impact the wool. Yes. So it's yeah. th- this will be and, a couple of years in transition. Yeah, and we've talked we've talked about sheep and and how they because we've talked about history of where they've come from originally and how they made their way to North America mm-hmm. and and the. Um, how they've adapted to North America. Some of them from northern, you know, the northern parts of Europe, um, specifically in Britain. They're, um, they're rugged, terrain and tough. There, there are yeah. certain breeds that that do extremely well in, in Canadian climates across yes. Canada. So you definitely could find a great uh, breed of sheep that produces wonderful, nice wool. And 
as we've talked about, not all broken wheels. So you could talk to us after this, and we can tell you a little bit about some sheep that would be. I would very, very much favorable. like that because Christopher yeah. has his favorites, our favorite. And, no, um, I have favorites. You have favorites. We could yeah. have like an, a collab. <laughs> we could have the the cabin boy knits uh, like special breed. <laughs> there you <laughs> go. People have. <laughs> well, it's not like Canada hasn't invented their own sheep. Yeah, they have. <laughs> they are caught in others. The thing, is, yeah. the thing is, with the sheep, they're they're they're. And that is one that we have is the the Rito Arcot. Okay. And the sheep are interbred just to get that you know to get that beautiful soft long staples, the desired staples, the softness, and then. You know they're they're bred with the different sheep for their their hardiness and their ruggedness, and so you will find there are options out there for having beautiful specific sheep. You yes, have better. You could have you know you could end up with the best wool in all of Canada just because of your location and 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 the time and effort and you know the love and the hard work that you put into it. You seriously could create this breed of sheep in this beautiful terrain, natural setting. Well, and that's. That is a place that we would very, very much like to get to because the farm has now spent 20 years not just building the, like, the, the sales of, of the blankets, but also building a brand. And that, yeah, and, and that you know, that stands for something. You know, when, when our name goes on a thing, it's because we have thought a lot about it and taken a great amount of care in the, the preparation for that. So, for instance one of our, our taglines is that winter makes better wool and it, it speaks to exactly what you're talking about winter makes better wool because it has to the sheep that are outside they have shelter you know they have sh they have trees to get behind and i will talk more about this later but topsy is actively planting more hedgerows and more buffer strips and mini forests yes. to protect them in the winter but still, they, you know, if, if their bellies are full and they have some trees to shelter behind, those hardy breeds of sheep you're speaking of, they're happy. Like yeah. they're, they yes. are happy outside and happy sheep make better wool. Yeah, for sure. And this, yep. is, and this is, you know, this is fact. Like, we're, you're, you're saying this and we're talking about this because people just think, oh, what? But it's absolutely fact with the way everything, the intake, the care, um, what they eat and it's like people who are, let's say, plant people, and they grow plants, and they and you talk to your plants, and you water them, and you, you love your plants. Well, yeah, they grow beautifully. And my friend who had chickens, he says he knew how to rub them just the right way under their belly, and they produced the best eggs. So, you know, if you're rubbing <laughs> the bellies of your sheep one way or another, you're going to produce this amazing wool. So you're doing everything right. And it's fact. You'll have this better staple of wool. And they yeah. said even, like, in a season, that might have been, like you're saying, maybe one winter is harsher than the other. Or, or there's like a slight drought for two weeks or something that you'll see that in the staple of the wool. So if you have a six inch staple, you'll actually see that just like you think like sedimentary rock where different ages where you see it and you'll see that like a tree, like anything, you'll see that in the fiber. Ooh, I'm thinking a, a branding line of blankets like a wine, whereas like here was that's our, was here is yes. our, our 2022 right. vintage. Absolutely. <laughs> but, it's absolutely but I was also true. thinking about wine when you were talking about the microclimate mm. and, and how the, it's shaping the wool or will shape the wool um by the sheep being here Did you say wool shape the wool <laughs> wool yes <laughs> <laughs> how it will shape the wool yes um because like when you think about prince edward county or you think about the niagara region they really promote the the area because they're saying that that really has an impact on the on the, the wine that they're, that's produced in those areas and so i that has to apply to sheep as well it does. when you when you think about you know the climates that they grow up in, the, the environment that they have, uh, the stress that they have, that all, all has an impact on the on the wool. And and good stress. Like yeah, winter, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Absolutely. winter yeah. is a good stress. Uh, my dad speaks of that as well. It's like doing a push up or yeah. whatever. You're putting. What's the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you had to break that down for <laughs> Not a broad. I know, a yeah, I was gonna. <laughs> I was gonna make the joke, but I wanted to let you make it instead. I know a little See, bit we, about a we lot teed of it up. But... Yeah, I know a little bit about it's not high it, heels but... and uh, snowshoes, right? <laughs> I want to go back to something you mentioned yeah. earlier, which I find really interesting. And that is, we were talking about, you look at wool and you think, well, this is probably not the most profitable, or it's, 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 it's the most difficult way to make money, and that's the road you're going to go down. And the reason I'm really interested in that is because when, we were th when I was thinking about dyeing and becoming a natural dyer, when you write the business case on that, people will say you're nuts. Like, yeah. <laughs> have another drink. Goodbye. And so, so we're kind of going down the similar road. So I want to know, 
you know, what it was that made you go down that road and how are you going to make it successful? So, I mean, a little bit of this is like, here's state secret. It is a, a market inefficiency. Yeah. The low cost of wool is a market inefficiency that Topsy plans to take advantage of. Oh, for sure. But for to sure. take advantage of in a way that the rising tide lifting all the boats. So there is no possible way that we on this farm and on this island can produce enough quality wool to supply the amount of products that we intend to get to. That's yeah. all the yarn, all the blankets. Sure. We sure. would like to be the first name in wool blankets and yarn in five years time. That's that's the ambition. Yeah. I like to start small. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but so so we can't do it ourselves. Okay, so then how are we going to get that? Well, we already have a connection of other farmers out there in Ontario yep. who are already doing the same kind of work that we do with the same sort of ethics that we have. Yeah. But they are getting paid nothing, nothing. for their raw material because mm -hmm. the, the people buying it is, is basically China and they want it as cheap as possible. Yeah, 90% so, of the, our yarn, Canadian yarn goes to China. 90% goes to China and they pay the farmer at the root source as little as possible that's the business plan ours our business plan is pay a farmer more for their quality stuff yeah and then they have an incentive to treat the animals well to treat the wool properly to skirt out all the bits of poop and yes. the burrs and the twigs and all that stuff that comes in it yeah and we'll probably talk about this later too but we've also developed a, a product for fertilizer using all that scrap so we'll buy the scrap too let's talk about that now because my sister knew, when i she knew i was coming here she said make sure you go into the shop and pick up a bag of what you've just talked about because um she bought some the last time she was here and gave it to her mother-in-law and put it in her garden and it was great sally's so, gardens <laughs> organic wool pellet fertilizer yes. there you go yeah we are pelletizing true. the shit <laughs> the the poop the stuff that is no good like for us what what topsy was doing with those bags before it's called belly wool it's it comes off the belly and the butt then you put it in a separate bag from the good stuff yeah and at the end you put it you, like what we would do is we would rent a truck and then drive it to Ottawa, which is where the, the like the co-op depot is, and we'd sell it for you know five cents a pound or whatever, and that wouldn't even cover the cost of the fuel, yeah, let right. alone the That's rental right. to right. take it up there. So yep. we you know we use it for mulch on the gardens, and then like hey these these plants are growing pretty well, uh, and so uh, we've we've been able to to license the patent because it is an existing patent using it for yep. fertilizer. So we right. yeah so we've negotiated. An arrangement that is and great. are now are sharing the sharing in the patent awesome yeah so that's uh that's that's the future so we will use every part of the sheep okay. and incentivize farmers by paying them right. properly for their good quality high quality raw material which your knitters and yeah your viewers will enjoy that's fantastic and you already have i mean you already have a, a, a business you already have great wool wool that's being sold that's just so that People know that yeah. you do have wool for sale now. You yes. have some good, great wool. You have stuff out there. Your blankets are amazing. Thank you. We've, we've been able to acquire a couple of them, and they're absolutely amazing. And you two and have done. So you two have done some very nice photo sessions with these blankets. <laughs> yes. Thank you. And <laughs> your tasteful <laughs> nudes are spectacular. <laughs> it's amazing what wine can do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> some of us don't need wine to do that, but <laughs> we had the blanket to keep. The bit. We had the, a good thing we had those blankets to keep the bits small. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> but they're beautiful and they're so... And it wasn't scratchy. Yeah. It wasn't scratchy. It's not scratchy. You no, know, that itch was something... No, no, no. <laughs> That'll be what it is. Um, why did that... No, it won't. <laughs> no, it won't. <laughs> Who are we kidding? That's we've right. seen we've seen his work before. That's right. <laughs> that's, that's why you bring Jamie along. That's right. Yeah. It's just a bounce off. For your childlike curiosity <laughs> and your bon mots. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Always learning, always wanting and willing to learn. Um, yeah, so you already have you have a good a, a business. It's just going to you just want to get to this this other level of yes. through marketing, improve your wool. Everybody's about improving everything, and 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 just bigger, more successful. And bottom line is to keep the land and yes. to keep this continuing for 
the next generation. We've at built the least. we've built the blueprint. Now it is time to scale up. That is okay. that is where we are right yep. now. It's this is the fourth year since the the retired shepherd and the other people who had started the farm have left. So it's the younger generation. This is our fourth year, and we are at the point now where we feel like we can scale up. But also the tractor oil needs to be changed. Also For sure. those yeah, fence lines stuff. need to be worked on. Yeah. Also the firewood needs to be brought in. Yeah. You know, and it's it's just this, you know, we're we're tired you know because like covid was hard on everybody it was yeah. hard on us too we sat down as a family and as a fa as friends and as a business in march of 2020 and we had the conversation of what are we going to do with our energy and our time because we felt that anxiety the same way as everyone For else sure. yeah our our choice was to do we turtle up and play defense or do we hit the gas go on offense and expand as far as we can go and and do it ethically and use this opportunity yeah and that's that's what we did we we planted gardens and we you know we've done lots of videos and, and blogs yep. and we've developed products and now we're just sort of tired <laughs> let's talk about <laughs> let's talk about the marketing piece of it now because it's You've done a great job for Topsy Farms. I'm not sure who's managing this, but the social media piece of it is fantastic. Your website's great, and Instagram's great. So who's who's doing all that? Uh, we like to say it's a little bit of everyone. Okay. It's uh, the you know the 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 blogs, the stories, the poems. It's a little bit of contribution from everyone. It's you know it wouldn't it wouldn't exist if it was just one person doing it. Because it feels like when you go on there you feel like you're connected to the farm in some way because you get there's a personality there which is fantastic and so that's a, it's, it's it's really great the uh the topsy voice a yeah. little, <laughs> little a little self-deprecating you know a little bit of ed like education a little bit of entertainment yes. and just kind of try to mix that all together with this this humble this humbleness that being surrounded by a lake will give you you cannot live in the country on an island without being humble because everything here wants to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, are there predators on here? Not for humans. Not just, for humans, but yeah. But for the sheep? Yeah, the, the coyotes are uh, one of our biggest problems. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's, it takes a constant energy output to keep the coyotes from exactly. coming into the fields. Do you have an idea how, like, how abundant are the coyotes on the island? It's difficult to say. And, uh, and could you do something about it? Or is that not right? Well, it's like our our goal is to to keep a, a pack of guardian coyotes nearby, but to give them incentive to not come into the fields. That is that is our working yeah. strategy. So we do that by really good fences, con like constant updates yeah. to the fences to keep high power in the in the lines, so that when they do try to come through, they'll get a zap and want to stay out. We uh, make sure that the guardian dogs are well fed and well positioned. So they are uh, constantly moving around with the flocks inside the field. We also use things, There's a, uh, it's called a predator eye. So it's a little flashing LED box that at nighttime will, will put out a strobe. Okay. Oh, wow. And you have to move those frequently, otherwise the coyotes adapt to it. And sure. they're like, oh, that's not a problem. We'll, we'll yeah. come in instead. Yeah. Uh, and then, there's like noise makers, like uh, f like flashing flashing things that you can use, like ribbons. Up. Yeah. So it's it's a it's a constant battle with the coyotes, but also maintaining this guardian flock of the alphas, who will have incentive not to come in, but also keep the other roaming coyotes away. Sure. So it's a huge amount of education to learn the psychology of the animal because they cannot be eradicated. It, it's impossible. Right. You could every even even if a person was able to wipe out every coyote on the entire island, which one is impossible. Two, hypothetically, if that happened, as soon as the ice came in, yeah, more would more, more yeah, would arise. Sure. So okay, that was my question because I was thinking yeah. it's an island, but yes, we're in Canada. The water freezes over, and then they just we're only two kilometers from the mainland. Yeah, yeah. so they just yes. they walk over. Okay. So the the goal is to maintain one alpha set nearby which will deter the others from coming oh, in okay. so when we we planted um 
we're replanting one linear kilometer of hedgerow yes. buffer. That's the, the our rewilding that Your we did in yes. 2021. So that was that was a huge amount of effort. We planted 600 trees and replanted um, 600 linear meters. What type of yeah. trees were you planting? A mix of everything that was native. So oh, we great. did uh, like berry berry trees, uh, lots of um, like a mix of deciduous uh, and coniferous. Yes. Just a, a little bit of everything. Yeah. Mix them all together. So in time, that buffer strip will be a corridor for all kinds of wildlife, including yes. voles and like field mice, yeah. which will scurry about doing their thing and will feed the coyotes. Yeah. Okay. Because they do this in Southern Ontario and there's, there's government incentives on farms in Southern Ontario, I know, that for them to create corridors, like you're talking about, um, just for, yeah, the traffic of the wildlife. Mm -hmm. so they can move from, you know, they're used to roaming if they're the larger, like deer, let's say, for example, they're roaming, you know, kilometers at a time. So they create corridors across these farm fields. But on this smaller insular island, um, you're, you're, yeah, you're reclaiming the land and, and naturalizing it once again with these corridors. Yes pretty much is what the rewilding is. That's, that's exactly what it is. So it's it's increasing the biodiversity, which is good for everything. And tell us about that bird that sounds like R2-D2. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I the, saw the that The bobble neck. Yeah. <laughs> Weep, bloop, bloop. <laughs> yeah. And we listened to it yeah. this morning. I thought, that's crazy. <laughs> it was it sounded just like it. Yeah. So, but that's what you're saying because... It's an endangered bird species that lives in pasture land. And as humans encroach on their space, they have less and less place to, to make their nests. Yeah. The the little dummies make their nests in long grass and that yeah. grass then gets mowed down yeah. by oh, farmers gosh. or just golf courses or, or anything. Yes. So what we're doing is basically making two fences. So one fence, you plant everything in the middle and then do a whole second fence. Oh, is that right? Yes. Okay. So if you imagine what a kilometer of that would look like, that's what we spent this year doing. Wow. Okay. It's a huge amount of effort. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't imagine the fences. I imagine just planting. You're just planting. Yeah, the but... sheep would love it if we did that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> They'd have a buffet. Right yeah, they have a okay. nice delectable buffet. <laughs> All that work. So tender. Gone in one season. Yeah. They um, would be gone in one afternoon. <laughs> oh what? Oh okay. Yeah. With how many sheep? Gone exactly. in one afternoon. Yeah. The so, wildlife must be amazing out here. The, 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 at least from the birds coming yes. through, because you're on the flight path. Yes. Along, uh, like Ontario, and it must be just incredible. It's you know, a fabulous, varieties. fabulous bird in corridor. Yeah. And and one that is fairly well renowned. Yeah, yeah. Now, okay. I want to I want to go back to thinking about you know, as you mentioned, the first hippies arriving, and then at some point in time, they they did as much as they could or wanted to do because some maybe wanted to break off or, or there was a transition period yep. where you know um, sex, drugs, and rock and roll only last so long. <laughs> right <laughs> there, you go. <laughs> and that was then, and this is now. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> still those no, are yeah, now of... there's no sex, no drugs, and no rock and roll. Yeah, definitely Pretty not. Pretty much. Pretty much. <laughs> but there's still some stuck in that in that mindset that you know will never go away. Um, but so there was a transition, a big transition there that was happening. Let's say right with the one group then deciding to um, part ways, yep. and then and then it grew into the that group of owners which would include your, your parents yep correct and so how is that transition now coming into your generation because it's into an, another transition that's because right 50 years later now this is the group of you're the group you and who who's who's working the farm now and all these newer people you've been here forever and your brother and yep. family members but then for let's say sally and ian now they're there's a transition that's yes. happening as we speak, and there'll be one more. So how how do they feel about where things are at now? And and they must be seeing such change from that time. I'm getting okay emotional all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> but no, but <laughs> thinking like the transition it's evolution. down, it's going evolution. from yeah. what they knew um, during those early days, and and a, I just imagine a wonderful, challenging, difficult life, but a wonderful life. And now they're at a, a certain age and they're seeing something different exciting that you're going to continue um but how how do they feel about what they see happening now it's got to be exciting for them but there's a, a transition that's happened again I, I think 
I think exciting is the right term for it. You know, it's it's strange for them, I think, especially because they are able to do less things on a daily basis. Sure. But yet, I mean, to your point, what they are seeing is a life's work continued. Yeah, yeah absolutely. A life's work continued. And absolutely. how few of us will ever be able to yeah. to get to, to see that. You know, my mom is training people in her way of planting the garden and her way yes. of doing the succession planting throughout the course of the year and and her way of saving the seeds. And that's one of the reasons we named the, the, the fertilizer after her space because yeah. she worked so oh, yeah. hard to, to do this. I mean, she started with clay ground and has, has worked this incredibly fertile space over over a whole lifetime, yeah. which, which is incredible. And, and my dad, like he had a really bad stroke almost a year ago right now. And we like, we thought we were gonna lose him. And he's been able to, to battle back to the point where he's out and about puttering around today. It is incredible. And he says, I, this is too interesting. I don't want to die yet. Yeah. You know, he's. That says it all, doesn't it? He's, that says it all. And his person, but he's a character. Where he's coming he is from a and character. his personality. Yeah. He's, he's, he's been through some struggles here. He has. Over the yeah. years. So he's one tough cookie. I mean, both Beyond. of them, yeah, both of them have essentially worked for free. Yeah. Doing this. Yes. What they have worked for is to be able to pass it mm -hmm. on. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, talk about emotional, like what, what greater gift could there possibly like yeah. we couldn't start this now we're just regular no, people absolutely. you can't buy 500 acres of waterfront yeah. and then like fill it with tractors and then fence everything you'd be yeah. you'd be 10 million dollars before you were able to yeah. just shear your first sheep like forget it like and to, and to think you'd just you know you'd be selling wool and blankets and mittens and hats yeah <laughs> <laughs> right the, right the like, only seriously. reason we're able to do this is because of this like sacrifice is probably not yeah. the right word but it is the right idea yes they have investment like it's investing their like their blood sweat and tears into this right literally and actually yeah and we had yeah. this conversation just this morning and on our way here he exactly is crying this, exactly <laughs> well we made it we made it 30 minutes into this <laughs> interview <laughs> before chris anyone was always the first up. one <laughs> chris was and always the first one <laughs> and so i just no because i think of these things because i do think about i think and you know you think about people don't really we're trying to make people understand and learn something here and people do you really think through what we're talking about and you know 50 years you, you can't even imagine and so and for your parents they must be so proud and i was going to mention as well as for there would have been a transition within for yourself and and and, and your and your your brother and your you know other family members who at some point like you came back here or you yes. always were here you went probably went to high school here and all of that and then can i just interrupt for one second yes because i want to ask about the universe what did you study in school Political science and public oh, hold policy. On a political science. Political That's science. Political science. <laughs> yep. And I never it's so adaptable to everything. Science. Farming, business. Oh. Okay, I should share that. Cheers, political because science. I use okay. it every day, and that's no yeah. BS. Yeah, I no, use I, it. I say the same thing. I use it yeah. every single day. The ability to to read a government document, wow. whether that is a grant application or a new yeah. a new policy or agricultural edict, yeah. which come out all the time you have to be able to parse that quickly tease out the important bits sure. and then figure yeah. out how to meet the deadline yeah and adapt adapt to it okay so let's go back to that transition for you then because then when you took that in university at what point would you been would you have been with the seriousness of this was going to be what you were going to do. And, and you, there had to be a moment, times where you're like, hey, I'm doing this now, or I come home from somewhere. I don't know how it went, you tell me. But then at some point there was a transition within yourself and this is a decision, you're doing this, and this is what you're doing. 99.9% .9 effective is what they say with birth control. And uh, <laughs> it was the 0.1% the which brought me back to Amherst Island. So oh, it was uh, my, okay. my, my first son, Nathan. Okay. He, uh, he came along without planning. And it was it was my my plan for that that degree. I wanted to do nuclear disarmament. I wanted to work for the oh. UN and you know travel yeah, to sure. Geneva. And different than what you're doing. A little yeah, a, a little bit different. Yeah. A little different. It was either it was either that or to you know to work in politics and do strategy sure. and, and things like that. I didn't want to be 
a an elected politician, but I, I thought working behind the scenes and you know and and writing policy and and figuring out election strategy, I thought that would be yeah. I thought that would be a pretty cool and fun thing to do. But it turns out this is the only place I ever wanted to one live and two to raise a family. Yeah. So as as soon as kids were brought in, uh, my wife Sue at the time she and I were like let's let's move back to the island and then we will figure out work from there so coming into the farm didn't happen immediately she and i kind of had our own our own businesses and our own projects that we worked on the farm just transitioned from there coming in full time on the farm was only maybe for me seven years ago that i was like full time on the farm and in any kind of decision making capacity and you're seeing now, though, that this university studies the study that you did has its benefits for exactly what you're doing. Exactly it? what I'm doing. And you're you're like, how long did you say you were here? Forty years. Yeah. Is that counting preconception? Because how old are you? <laughs> I, 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 I just, Jamie's trying to do the math right yeah, now. I, wait, I, I, wait, wait. I'll, I'll squint. Wait, I'll, I'll squint, 32. and then you can count. You can count my tree line. Look at that. Okay, yeah, 30, thirty-four. No, uh, I, I just turned forty in uh, August. Oh, that's a big one. I just okay. turned forty in August. Amazing. Yeah. So now I lost my train of thought. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you decided. So you you made the move back to the farm, and you knew it was going to be a permanent move. So this your polit- political studies has brought you to this point. So it's all sort of come together, but it still all comes back to the wool, doesn't it? It does, because the wool is the future, and that's that's the thing that will be able to keep the farmland as a farm. That needs to be on a T-shirt. <laughs> wool the wool is, is the future. future. Let's, let's do a, that a, is cro- it. Let's do a cross promotion. Right. The wool is the future. You heard it here first. Yeah. True. Because people don't realize, still people don't realize to this day. Because one of our last, um, one of our last uh, podcasts, what do you call it? YouTube. An episode. Episode. <laughs> <laughs> what we do? Why would That's you not know what it's called? It's well, not going to be edited out. <laughs> yeah, well, that thing that we do. We talked about the wool and the, that thing you with know, the camera. Yeah. Biodegradable and non-biodegradable yes. products, and and they people who don't know wool, and you know most people watching will. But it is the miracle fiber. Yes. People know that, but people may not know exactly. It is the miracle fiber for all of its properties of what it's been, you know, a garment for centuries. We know that for a fact. And because of its long lasting, your blankets will last easily a hundred years. They could last longer than that. We had a latrine hat that we did an episode on. That was, how old was that thing? 400 years old. 400 years old because they found it in the sediment of the soil of a loo at Louisbourg. <laughs> and there Someone was. Someone was like, oh <laughs> shit, my hat. I know, and he left it there, believe it or not. So how does this relate to blankets? <laughs> it relates because of the longevity of the okay. wool, because here this hat Got was it. rediscovered recently, <laughs> yeah. relatively recently, yeah. completely intact in what you use for fertilizer in the loo. And so in the outhouse on Louisbourg, and you're going to have these wonderful blankets that you produce that you can purchase out of very easily. They blankets, are beautiful. They are so gorgeous. <laughs> and They're really nice. They could have it for with care. They could, but there's no reason it can't last. Two hundreds of years. of years. Exactly. Hundreds, literally. My cell phone won't last that long. I mean, what things <laughs> do we buy anymore? Right. What what things do we buy anymore that is going to last any Absolutely. length of time? Let alone be a thing that could yeah. be passed down to the next generation. Absolutely. I I have this knitting group. It's Thursday night knitting group, and we were t- actually talking about topsy blankets. And and I'm the only Canadian on the call. They're um, all Americans. So and a couple of them have been to the shop. So they uh, they purchased your your blanket. Um, so Thank it's, you for it's that. Very well. Very well done. Cheers. True. Yeah, it's true. It's true for sure. Yeah. We we very much appreciate that because that is how we keep the farmland as a farm. We can't do this just as an agricultural business. It's yeah. impossible. All those things we talked about earlier, you can't. It's the everything costs too much. Yeah. And as as the price of real estate rises, like everything, the all the property taxes go up. You cannot hold a thing this big without finding an alternative way to fund it. Sure. And I think that's that's almost like most businesses today, I think, have to diversify in order to survive. And with yourself and your this this generation, the younger generation, and there'll be more to come, um, you're managing that, you've managed that, you're doing it. But like you say, you've got goals that to me 
it could only succeed because of the history and the it goes back to the harmony and the history and the love that you all have for this property and this land that you're going to carry forth and there's so many people in the area that know about you now that i think it's going to work and i think you believe that and if you don't you need well, to well it's, yeah. it's funny <laughs> because it's not just the area like well you i know your yarns and some yarn shops too and um and i so when i pick it up and talk to the store owner they they mentioned sally like oh sally's so great and yeah. whatnot which is really interesting because when do you pick up a yarn and they can personalize it or yes. talk about somebody attached to it so it, it's the it's the yarn but also and when you go to yarn um festivals you'll see topsy farm yarn there as well uh, with some of the vendors but it's the blankets as well that they've a lot of people will give them as wedding gifts and use them for themselves and whatnot because um, i know we I, I love the blankets and i love using them as well so we especially in the winter time i love that feeling of having layer 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 and you're you're, you're freezing cold in the winter time and you've got this these warm blankets on top of you they're fantastic but they're multi-use like people you know the, the colors that we come in and whatnot are just fantastic so and how are they produced definitely... did we even tell about where they because the wool Sally's not there back there on her you know, <laughs> blankets. So have we talked to her? Well, well, and 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 someday, someday we'll we'd like to get to the point of having our own mill oh. here on the farm. Oh my you know, gosh, that's, that'd be fantastic. That's, that's future, future. But okay. uh, there's a huge need for that in yeah. Ontario. Huge and but uh, and, you know, until such time, we we make them you know piecemeal as we can. But I like to your to your point earlier about that you know the the name getting out there i think what resonates is is the story you know being sure. being founded yeah. by hippies and then making this place that people can come and visit anytime we are open every single day of the year like we we do not close and we make it so that a person a family can visit and go and walk in the trails we have kilometers worth of trails up in the woods that a person can just come, you put your name down at the wool shed, that's your sign in, there's no there's no cost. Yeah. And that is the thing that we fund, we fund all that trail upkeep with the with the sale of the product. When yeah. people buy a wool blanket, they are also making it so a school group or or a, you know a, a retirement home can come to the farm, get some lamb snuggles, get dirty, be happy and learn about agriculture and learn about the farm and why sheep are important and how wool will save the world. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting. Wool is the future. Wool is the future. <laughs> I think it's past, present, and future. There you go. It is. But just so you do have, you do have uh, uh, many events that go on around here. Yes. I mean, I know that you're, I've seen an amazing stone wall over there. Oh, yeah. So yeah, you gotta come and see the thing. wall. So yeah. you have that as an event. You have music. You have music. You yeah. have, and what else? What else? I heard they have some amazing natural dye yarn classes natural dyeing yarn <laughs> classes right here in this space that right used to in be this area this yeah. this uh artisanal hippie built root cellar <laughs> that's right that's which right. has been repurposed it's absolutely incredible yeah. <laughs> where were you? you you didn't even show up to that class were you in paris <laughs> <laughs> that's why you don't know about it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i feel terrible now it's like oh you're going to, oh right is that the same weekend oh <laughs> I booked a trip to Paris last minute. It's a thing where I didn't know. Anyway, yeah, it was just it came up and I went. But yeah, like wool is the future, but also, and it's super cliche, but kids are the future. But here's the thing, and this is my revel, my revelation in making making these events and the the team here making these events is that the kids that we are often seeing are afraid of nature. We, we had one young lad being offered pears from the organic pear tree, but was afraid to eat it because of being dirty. He thought it was, he thought it was dirty. He wouldn't, you know, he was hungry. He was in the mood to eat a pear, but wouldn't eat it because it was dirty. But it's, it's the most natural, yeah, cleanest yeah. thing yeah. on earth. And here we are humans, our generation and those before us kind of wreck the place. You know, we've, we've destroyed a lot of the natural world and part of our survival strategy as humans is oh well that you know the kids will save it the next generation will will save it but they're being taught to fear the natural world yeah as being like oh don't scuff your jeans 
because you know that's true. You, you know you don't you don't want to get your jeans dirty or yes. you know don't don't put that you know don't put that thing don't get your hands dirty because you're gonna get sick yeah, yeah. but how are the, how are the kids gonna save what's left in the natural world if they're taught to fear it so part of our mission is to bring kids to the farm and just get them dirty and have fun and swing on the swings and, and chase the animals around. Yep, get away from the computers and get, away get outside. From the computer. Yep. Well, are you going to show us the shack now? I'm dying to see the you. You bet I will. Oh, excellent. Uh, and um, thank you very much for coming and visiting. This was a true pleasure. How else would we spend a beautiful November Sunday afternoon? It's uh, tea in the root cellar. It was tea fantastic. Just cheers. Thank you so and much. Thank you so much. That was that was great. Really enjoyed it. So show us around. There's <laughs> more to see. Yeah. <laughs> show, no, come on, show us the goods. Oh yeah, here <laughs> we, we go. See the goods. <laughs> All right. So welcome to the Topsy Farms Wool Shed. We like our utilitarian names here. We have the Gray Barn, the Wool Shed. <laughs> so come on in. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. Hello, welcome. Hello, everybody. Here's all the things. Wow. I'm normally not allowed in here because I give everything away. <laughs> this is great. Beautiful. So how's everything laid out? So we have the yarn all on this side. Leah, will you yes, talk through yarn, this part? Yes, the I'm yarn is all over here. Well, first of all, we have at the front and center, we have the alpaca blankets. This is a wool alpaca blend. And as far as we can tell, this is the only blanket in the world that is 100% Canadian wool and Canadian alpaca. Oh, wow. So nice. this is our this is our very, very first nice. thing. And Gorgeous. Yeah, it feels it's so nice. My so gosh. So soft. Yeah, and Gorgeous. we picked the name Live Edge because, like, the harvest tables, which the natural yes. beauty is in the yep. imperfection, this is exactly as it's come off the animal. So yeah. nothing's been dyed, nothing's oh been changed. It's all just the altered. natural the natural um, tones of the alpaca fiber. Beautiful. The They're fiber. absolutely gorgeous. Thank you. So, yeah, and then we have um, the Headlands collection of blankets over here. These guys are all queen size. And the Lighthouse collection of wool filled bedding. Wow, look at the colors. The colors are amazing. Great. And so, so what do we have here? Do, is this, are these pillows? Yeah, filled so, with so wool? we have pillows, um, mattress toppers, and duvets. And they are, it's unbleached cotton on the outside and wool on the inside. So this is what nice. they're stuffed with. Very and nice. everything is machine washable. Oh wow, that's great. And then we also have sheepskins. One of them is there, and we've got more over here. Oh yeah, and this is this is what the um, the duvet looks like when it's all folded out. That's great. That's terrific because I. I am allergic to our down duvet, so wool is oh, okay. a great alternative. Yeah, good. And the great thing about wool is it keeps you, it tends to keep your body at the temperature it wants to be at. Yeah. So it's much harder to get overheated in a wool duvet than it is to get overheated with feathers or any other fiber. Yeah. It's a, it's a miracle fiber. Wool is the future, <laughs> right? That's right. Wool is the future. So, so then we have some, some of our gift boxes. Um, some of the handmade stuff, all the handmade stuff is hand done by local knitters. I recognize this pattern. Oh yeah? That is, yeah. That is one of our most popular hats. Yeah. Yeah, we, we sell a ton of those. That's great. Who's this handsome guy up here? This is our patriarch. This is Ian Murray, our dad and one of the founders. And the portrait was done by an island artist called Chris Laffin, who does, as you can see, oh beautiful, God. beautiful, God, amazing, fantastic. amazing. Jeez. Yeah. That's great. He, he was probably in the middle of explaining something. He very <laughs> evocative with his hands, or emotive with his hands. And so here's and the, so here's the yarn. This yarn. We have. Aaron, worsted, and fingering weight. Great. Really nice. 
Then you've got honey here. And we well. have honey as well, yep. More of that biodiversity. Exactly. Is that a coloring book or what is that? Uh, that is our first in the Topsy Farms children book series. And it's, uh, that is, uh, you can get it as a standalone item and it also comes in our Cozy Baby gift box. Nice. And yeah, we're, we're super excited about it. That just came out this year and uh, it's the first in a series. So there will be more coming soon. And then we have our island calendar by uh, Woody, who's an island photographer. And the other book is um, a book that is set on the island. Um, and it's a, it's like a, it's kind of for tweens, but it's sure. really for every age. So yeah, I guess this is sort of our library zone now. And then we have the pellet fertilizer. Did you guys talk about that yeah, already? We did, yes. We are back, and what a great outing that was. Outing? <laughs> Interview. <laughs> it was an outing. It was an absolute outing because we spent how much time outside? We spent the whole you got afternoon outside. You definitely got sunburn. I did get a little sun. Yeah. And you got a little sun. I did. It was a beautiful, gorgeous November day. It was perfect. It was a perfect day. It was so nice. And Jacob was the best host. It's fantastic. Well... It's Jake to me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll go with that. <laughs> anyway, I just, I was amazed at just the, when we talk about the history of Topsy Farm mm -hmm. and we look at the, you know, how it started off as a hippie commune and how it's evolved over the years and each generation is putting their own mark on it is really fascinating. Yeah. And, and, and all of their plans moving forward and with the sustainability and they've, they, they even have that award as well, that award about sustainability as a tourism sort of farm. They're doing everything that seems right, that is the right thing to do in this day and age when it comes to environment, the way they raise their sheep, the the way they treat the land, the way they grow everything on their land. Yeah. And I think, I think Jake's um, knowledge, do you remember what he said about taking political science in university? But he said how much that's helped him with, with these ongoing sort of projects and things that they need to do and and um, applying for government and environment and and all of these different um, you know things that they're trying to get going how he said that comes really into play do you know what I studied in university no <laughs> you'll need to read my bio I uh, hopefully there'll be another article about me so you can read it and find out <laughs> all kinds of new I was a political already. science major as well that's why oh we, my that's gosh. why we were clinking glass. That's why we're always doing this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, okay, well, I learn things every day. So what were we talking about? Topsy we were, Farms. Yeah, and it, the other, um, well, I was just going to say yeah. the amount of land that they have. And what I found really interesting was that their house is on the bay side of, of the island, like facing the, the mainland. And when you go to the other side of the island where the sheep were, he, he, he told us, he said, you better be wearing mittens because it's cold. And it was cold. It was and considerably cold. Yeah, right? absolutely. Because and it's open to the elements because it's on the open water and yes. coming from the western, they're on the like sort of like the western tip of the island. Yeah. So um, for those of the who, I mean, everyone knows the Great Lakes, or if you should know the Great Lakes, or if you don't, they're Great Lakes. They're big, and when they're you're great. There, they're large, and it seems like you're on the ocean, and the winds can pick up and whip yes. up that water. And, you know, you can't see across the lake. I mean, from some points you can, but not from there. So you really imagine yourself, it's kind of like on the ocean. Yeah. So the weather is very um, harsh and windy and beautiful, and we had a gorgeous sunny day. So wonderful afternoon spent with Jacob. It was fantastic. And... and all of the people that support the farm as well. Sally was there. We got to see Sally. And um, Ian, we got to say hello Ian, to Ian. You had yeah. a little chat with him. Yeah. I had a little chat with Sally. And they're always so welcoming. Yes. They just want to say hi, and they're the friendliest people. Um, absolutely a delight and wonderful afternoon. I said, you know, at the end, I said, you know, this you couldn't have had a better day. Like, you talk about days where that was just a great day, a good day. It was wonderful. It was a wonderful visit. It was a wonderful <laughs> outing. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. But and and I think what topped it off was not only the tea by the fire, and 
the conversation, but it, it was also the wool shop. And we went to the yeah. wool shop. We went to the wool shop, and just so you know, he mentioned the fireplace, because I don't know if you could catch it on the side of the camera, but you might uh, hear some crackling sounds. This is actually the, the outdoor fire that we were sitting next to. Um, but then, yes, we went from our little tea area, and then we went to the, what do they call it? Do they call it the wool shed, or is yeah. it called yeah. the wool shed? Yes, we'll go with that. That's a store. It's a shop. It's a outbuilding with a lot of Topsy Farms beautiful things. Oh my gosh, Jamie, I want to talk about my yarn. <laughs> Why don't we start with something else? <laughs> okay. Because I'm just overheating only because, you know, it's not freezing in the cabin. Oh, you want to start with that? I well, didn't, I didn't pick just, up on your clue. Yeah. So you want to talk about the blankets? Let's talk about okay, these. Okay, sure. Yeah. Okay. I love these. <laughs> what do you want to say about them other than they're wonderful? <laughs> and you love it because they're cozy and warm. I don't want to take it off. Yes. Well, they're known for the blankets. Yeah. And the way he had mentioned, I think around 1995, where they, they um, on a trip to Prince Edward Island, yes. and they work hand in hand. They ship their wool off their, from their beautiful sheep, their beautiful yarn, their yeah. wool, and it comes back into these beautiful multicolored there's a variety of colored blankets that are just incredible. Yeah, I love them. Yeah. Topsy okay, so farm. is it did you want to take yours off? Is that why you wanted to talk about yes, it first? And okay. And there you have Topsy Farms. Okay, well Jamie's disrobing. I'm gonna talk about the yarn because this okay. is such a good deal. This is Aaron Waite and it is gorgeous. It's a beautiful green color and as soon as I saw it, I thought, sweater. I want to knit a sweater. Yeah. And it, it feels great. It, it's perfect for a sweater. And the price is amazing for these. Absolutely. And especially when you want to knit a sweater, you need a good quantity. Well, well not a large, large quantity for Christopher, but a <laughs> quantity of yarn. <laughs> and so you want it to be, you know, price effective. <laughs> oh, it's really good. It's, it's yeah, amazing. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was was nine dollars or eleven dollars each, something like that. Wow! So you can't beat that. Yeah, it's great, and so I'm looking forward to knitting a sweater with this. And I love it when you're looking at yarn and something clicks right away, and you think, you know, that it would be perfect for that. This is going to look amazing as yeah. a sweater. It's, it's a deep, it's a deep forest green, but it also has flex. Yeah, flex of like, is that the natural, the natural sheep colored yarn? Like yes, in yeah. under it, like there's flex yeah. of, of, of this rusty brown and yeah it's absolutely very earthy to me it looks like it was very dyed on looking. a fiber that was non-white so it could have been gray in it yeah or, but it's really nice gray and brown and it's yeah. absolutely beautiful do you want to go next or well why don't we talk about what if do you have there i see some mittens yep they ab absolutely they magically appeared those don't look like so mittens. my niece does not those watch mittens. watch this those aren't mittens no it's not oh did you want the mittens first <laughs> <laughs> I, he's not even, he still doesn't listen to what I say. I said, oh, those are lovely mittens, and he's not even, he heard something, but not really. No. <laughs> I was, they just feel great. That's so I was, that's what I get, this is what I get like when I'm around wool. He gets giddy and excited and loses yeah. all train of thought. Okay, here are the mittens. And they're, they'll be a Christmas gift. Yeah, they're, yeah. I love the color. And what's, in, what's thrum, inside, what do you call it? Thrum that? mittens. What? Thrum. Thrum, like thumb, but with an R. Yeah. And what does that mean? Um, it means, well, it's the way, it's just the way that they are. So they're stuffed, they're stuffed with um, wool inside. Is that, well, wait a minute though. Are that's those, the prop. That's no, the, no, no, no. Are those the yes. ends of these little white yes. flecky things? Yes. And so they, they add um, warmth to the mitten. So you, you knit those in there and then you, you leave, that's part of the pattern, the and you bits, leave them. You leave yeah. the bits. You leave the bits in there, and then you got. Yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's so amazing. Yeah. So yeah. they're really nice. These are for someone, someone <laughs> Santa, <laughs> to someone, someone from Santa. Santa. No, there's. Oh, never mind. <laughs> we won't go there. <laughs> and then these are really nice too. Oh, they all of the. I, I think we covered this in the in the video, but mm -hmm. the locals are, are the ones who knit these. Oh, the mittens as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's amazing. And that here are some wonderful. fingerless gloves, and they would be perfect for my niece. So maybe she would be getting gorgeous. those. Look, let's have a little show. Oh, they fit. Oh, I love, I love yeah, those. Yeah, they're nice. Hmm. 
Who are they for? <laughs> <laughs> they fit beautifully. <laughs> You'll have to arm wrestle Avery for them. Oh. Can you see those? Oh, they're opposite. Are they? They are. I was wondering how long it would take to figure that out. <laughs> I'm like, that's wrong. These are mismatched. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're nice. Oh, that is very cool. So what else do we have? And then my sister uh, asked for a, s a special request. Oh. And this is from... Sally's Garden Organic Fertilizer, 100% raw wool. And they make these into pellets, and then you put them into your garden. And she has an incredible garden. She's been she gardening has an amazing garden. Ever and ever and ever. Yeah. And she has in, an incredible garden, incredible, beautiful flowers. What else do they grow? All kinds of things. But vegetables. Yeah, but, but this swears by it, and it's been tried and true because your sister's already tried it, hasn't she? My sister's mother-in-law has tried it, yes. Sister's mother-in-law. Okay, and she said everything sort of exploded. When she loved she it. Used yeah, it. she loved it so much that she ordered some more. Yeah. So that's what we got. And that I know you picked up something. I did pick up something. It's down here. Let me just let me just get that. Oh, let me just get that. Oh, here we go. <laughs> now, can you see that? Wow. Oh my gosh, they're going to be my skating socks. I have never seen figure skating socks like that before. <laughs> I I do a, a quite a great impersonation of Elvis Stoiko. Google it, Elvis Stoiko on ice. I think Dorothy Hamill Google that. That's <laughs> like, but you don't have her hairdo. <laughs> I could I could get at that hairdo. She'd be about my age now, wouldn't she? Sure. Anyway, we'll go with that. Yeah. Anyway. I love these socks. They're gorgeous. They're just they're really nice. So oh yeah. my gosh, I'm not used to bending that way. Um, yeah, these the red, the gray. It's just something so. Did you see the side of it? <laughs> There's something so Canadian about these socks. Well, th I love them. Yeah, they're and nice. And they're extra long. I just think, You're I mean, I bragging. saw them and I'm like, yeah. I need those socks. They're yeah, beautiful. they're really nice. Absolutely beautiful. Oh, yeah. crap, Can you crap, get your leg crap, back down? <laughs> crap. Um, anyway, I had a fantastic time. That was great. Really enjoyed it. Um, it, was, it was such a wonderful we, experience. It is. You know, they there's they could they can go on. They have stories to tell. They they you know you need to just Google Tops, Topsy Farms, follow them. They have incredible um, footage of the farm, and you think everyday life on the farm is just something you think about. Maybe I think hard work, hard work. But for for the average person, I think it's maybe scenes that you see in a movie. There might be a you know a, a couple of minutes somebody walking through a you know. A, through a field and they're, you know, they're the sheep in the background or, or there might be a shepherd or going in the, you know, but to actually see what they do on a regular basis and they, they post videos that are so informative, but they're also beautiful and delightful and yeah. it's just like, wow, 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 wow. Yeah, I'd highly recommend you to check it out. Yeah. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as we enjoyed interviewing Jacob or Jake and um, I'd love to hear your feedback on it as well. Yeah, and so thank you, Topsy Farms. Thank you, Jake. Thank you, Sally, Ian, and, there are the, and the rest and of the, the crew. And the few that we had a chance to chat with. Thank you so much for showing us around. And we finally met Jake's wife. We did. Yeah, and, super nice. Oh, and we, yeah. And the dogs. And we met the Oh, sheep. the beautiful dogs. We met the oh my sheep gosh. and the cows. Anyway, <laughs> we could go on and on. So have a great week, everyone. Uh, take care. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.